If you are looking for a way to apply Python and machine learning to a real-world application, this is the course for you. You will learn all about bioinformatics for drug discovery using Python. Channon is a professor of bioinformatics, and he knows how to break things down in a way that is simple to understand. Welcome to the Bioinformatics from Scratch course. My name is Chenin Nata Sedamad, and I'm an Associate Professor of Bioinformatics. In this course, you'll be learning about bioinformatics through the lens of drug discovery. No prior knowledge of bioinformatics or biology is needed, although if you have some, it will be helpful. And so we're starting from the basics, which means that we're going to start from collecting data sets to pre-processing the data set to performing exploratory data analysis or EDA, and also to build machine learning models in order to make prediction as well as to obtain data-driven insights that will be useful for drug discovery. And then you're also going to be learning how you could compare machine learning models and then selecting a suitable one for your use case. And then finally, we're going to be deploying the model as a web application. And actually, I've created an infographic where I will summarize all of the content of this particular video in an infographic style. And so let's have a look. And so this is the infographic of the Bioinformatics from Scratch series that was on my YouTube channel called Data Professor. And so in this collaboration with Free Code Camp, we're going to combine all of the six part series into one video course. And so let's have a quick overview of what you'll be learning in this course. So in part one, you're going to be learning about target protein search, which means that you're going to select a target protein of your interest that you will focus on. For example, if you want to have a machine learning model for discovering breast cancer drugs, then you're going to select aromatase as your target protein search. Or if you're looking into Alzheimer, you might want to search for acetylcholine esterase, which we'll be using in this particular series. And then we're going to collect the data set from the Chambo database using the Python library from Chembo. And then we get the bioactivity data, and then we're going to pre-process that, dropping the missing data, dropping duplicate data, and then we're going to label compounds according to their bioactivity thresholds in order to obtain a curated data set. And then in part two, we're going to perform exploratory data analysis, whereby we're going to firstly clean the SMILES notation, which represent the chemical structure of the compound in the data set that we're going to analyze in the video series. And then we export that out as files number four and five, which will be available to you in the GitHub repo provided in the video description of this video. And so the number four or five here will be labeled in the description. And so what it essentially means is that they have two class or three class, which is the Y variable. And then once we have cleaned the SMILES notation, we're going to calculate descriptors in order to perform EDA. And for EDA, we're going to use visual part and also we're going to perform statistical analysis as well. And then in part three, we're going to calculate additional descriptor, which we will be using in order to build machine learning models in the subsequent part, which is part four. And so in part four, we're going to build a random forest model for performing prediction on quantitative data, which is the PIC50, and therefore it is called the regression model. And finally, we'll make a scatter plot in order to see the distribution or the goodness of fit of the actual value and also the predicted values. And then in part five, we're going to compare several machine learning models and then we're going to make a performance comparison plot, as you see here. And then in the last part, part six, we're going to deploy the model by making it into a web application, meaning that the user could input the molecule of their interest, and then the web app will be making the prediction. And so we have a lot to cover here in the six part series, but no worries because I'm going to provide a step-by-step -step guide from the basics. And so without further ado, let's get started. Welcome back to the Data Professor YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Chenin Nanta Senamad, and I'm an Associate Professor of Bioinformatics. On this YouTube channel, we cover about data science concepts and practical tutorials. So if you're into this type of content, please consider subscribing. 
So in the previous video, I have shown you how you can apply machine learning on a computational drug discovery project. Particularly, we downloaded a data set derived from the study of Delani, and the data set is essentially a collection of compounds along with their molecular solubility value, which is a important physical chemical property of compounds on whether it can be solubilized in water to what extent. And so some of you might be wondering, what if you want to collect original data? Let's say that you want to create a new data science project for your portfolio and you want something that is new, original, has never been done before, then this video is for you. Because in biology, there is a lot of unknown that is waiting to be researched about. And so in this video, I'm going to show you how you can retrieve and download biological activity data of compounds from the Chembo database, which you can subsequently use to construct machine learning models, which is also technically known as quantitative structure activity relationship. And so the development of such QSAR or QSAR models holds great value for drug discovery efforts. Particularly, it allows us to understand the origins of the biological activity and the interpretation of the model will allow us to understand how we can design a better drug. And so such data that you're going to collect and download today by following along with this video, not only will allow you to build your data science portfolio, but may also initiate or scratch the surface towards the development of novel therapeutic agents or novel drugs. And so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing that you wanna do now is head over to the GitHub of the data professor and then click on the code repository and then scroll down, click on Python, scroll down and click on the CDD ML part one bioactivity data. And then right click on the raw link and you wanna save it into your computer. Or if you would like to follow along on the Google Colab, you are more than welcome to do so. So what you want to do is go to Colab and then click on the file open notebook and then click on the GitHub tab and then type for data professor, enter. And then it's going to be the first file that you see here, CDD ML part one. Okay, and then you want to click on that and then it should open up a new notebook for you. But I already have that, so I'm going to follow the one that I have open right here. So the exciting part of this video is that you're going to collect original data. So it's gonna be the same data that researchers in the field are collecting and publishing about. And so today you're going to have the opportunity to contribute to computational drug discovery. Okay, so the database that we're going to use is called Chembo Database, and it is a database comprising of more than 2 million compounds, and it is compiled from more than 76,000 documents. And the version as of March 25, 2020 is Chembo version 26. Okay, and so the first thing that you want to do here is to install the Chembo web resource client, and so we're going to use the pip install here. So this library will allow you to download the biological activity data directly from the Chembo database. But before we do that, let me show you how the Chembo database actually looks like. So you can search on Google for Chembo, C-H-E-M-B-L. Okay, so let's say that we're gonna search for coronavirus. And then we're gonna go with the Search for coronavirus in all targets. We're going to click on that. And so the targets here refers to the target proteins or target organism that the drug will act on. So biologically, these compounds will come into contact with the protein or the organism and induce a modulatory activity towards it. It could either be to activate the protein or the organism or to inhibit it, okay? And so this will give us seven targets here. And if we scroll down, we're gonna see the type of the target would be comprising of organism and single protein. 
and the single protein will be SARS coronavirus 3C like proteinase and the replicase polyprotein 1AB. And so these are for the SARS coronavirus 1. And so as you can see that the SARS coronavirus 2 is not yet deposited in this database. And so we're going to work with what we have here. Okay, so let's head back to the notebook and the Chembo web resource client should have already been installed. And let's proceed with importing the library. So here we're going to import the pandas as PD and we're going to use from Chembo web resource client dot new client import new client. Okay. And then in this section, we're going to search for the target protein. And so it's essentially going to be the same process that we're searching right here. In the search bar, we type in coronavirus. So we're going to do exactly in the code. But first, we're going to assign new client.target to the target variable. And then we're going to create a variable called target underscore query equals to target.search. And then the search keyword will go here. And then we're going to create a target's data frame. And then we're going to assign the target query inside the argument using the from dictionary function okay and then finally we're going to display the contents of the data frame and then we're going to run this in order to see that okay and so here we see seven results and it's the same thing that we see here seven targets okay so seven results here and then notice that there are two single protein right here and the rest are organism so same thing right here we have two single protein and the rest being organism, okay? And so in this tutorial, we're going to use the single protein for our further investigation. Okay, and so let's go to the next step. So in this section, we're going to select and retrieve bioactivity data for SARS coronavirus 3C-like proteinase, which is the fourth entry right here. Or actually, it's the fifth entry, but it has the index number of four. Okay, so it actually is fifth entry. Let's call it fifth entry. Okay, and so let's run the cell. And so notice that the Chembo ID here is Chembo3927. So this is the target ID. So it's a unique identification of the target. Okay, and so here we're going to define a variable called activity and we're going to use new client dot activity and then afterward we're going to define a variable called res and then we're going to assign it the block of code here which is activity dot filter and then in the argument here we're going to use the target chembo ID equals to the selected target and then we're going to have the closing parenthesis as part of the filter function and then we're going to apply another filter which is to select only the values containing IC50 for the column called standard type. Okay, and so I'm going to show you that in just a moment. And let's show the contents of the data frame. Because there are so many columns. Why don't I show only the first three? Because the font is rather big and we need to access the scroller here. Okay, so let's find the column that I was talking about. The standard type. So here, standard type, IC50. Okay, so we're going to select only the IC50 here. And so let me show you what are the unique values in the standard type column. Okay, and so we see that there are only IC50 here. Okay, so for this particular data set, it wouldn't matter because all of the value here are the same and they are IC50. But in cases of other data set, there might be a combination of other bioactivity unit types. So it might be IC50, it might be EC50, or it could be percent activity. So when we define a particular standard type here, it will make our data set more uniform. And so we won't have a mixture of different bioactivity units. Okay, so we're going to use only the IC50 type. And the standard value is the potency of the drug. And so the number here represents the potency. And so the lower the number, the better the potency of the drug becomes. Okay. And likewise, the higher the number, the worse the potency becomes. 
Okay, so ideally we want to find a number of the standard value to be as low as possible, meaning that the inhibitory concentration at 50% will have a low concentration, meaning that in order to elicit 50% of the inhibition of a target protein, you would need lower concentration of the drug. Let's think of it this way. The number here reflects the concentration of the drug. And so the lower the concentration that is required, the better it is. Because if you have higher number, it means that you require more amount of the drug in order to produce the same inhibition at 50%. And so analogously, let's say that if you could take 5 milliliter of a medication versus 5 liter of medication, right? But which is impossible in order to produce the same effect. Which one would you choose, right? Okay, so something to think about. So let's go back to here. All right, and so finally, we're going to write out the data frame into a CSV file, and we're going to call it the bioactivitydata.csv, and we're going to have the index number to be false because we don't want the index number to be in the resulting CSV file. Okay, so let's write that out, and let me mount my Google Drive into the notebook, and so I'm going to click here. Okay, and so I'm going to paste in the authorization code. Enter. All right, so it's mounted. Um, I think I might have already run this because the data folder has probably been created. But let me check. Okay, so it's right here, data. So it has already been created. Okay, but for you guys, let's say I create data too, okay? So for you guys creating a new folder called data in your Colab notebook folder for the first time would probably work. So let's continue. And so we're going to copy the bioactivity data here into the folder. And let's ls that. And we're going to see the bioactivity data. So let me also add the dash l function here. So I can also see the time at which it is created. And it is created on April 29th. So it's right now. And so let's see the content of the CSV. So let's list this again in our current working directory. And we're going to take a glimpse of the contents of the bioactivity data. And it looks like this. So it's a CSV data, okay? And then we're going to proceed to the next step. We're going to do some handling of the missing data, if there is any. And then we're going to drop compounds with missing standard value. So the thing is, we have already dropped any missing values here. Okay, so apparently for this data set, there is no missing data. However, this code might come in handy for other data sets where there is missing data. Okay, so let's proceed to the next step. And so here we're going to do some data pre-processing of the bioactivity data. So for the benefit of creating machine learning models where we could classify compounds into three categories as either being a active compound, an inactive compound, or an intermediate compound. And so the active compound will be defined as drugs that have IC50 of less than one micromolar. And one micromolar is equal to 1,000 nanomolar. And so a drug having IC50 value of less than 1,000 nanomolar will be classified as active. And a drug having IC50 value greater than 10,000 will be classified as inactive and drugs having value in between 1,000 and 10,000 will be called intermediate. So in some of the research projects that we have normally done, we either use the two class or the three class. Okay, and so we're going to use the conditions as defined here that I have already told you about. And so we're going to run this block of code. And then we're going to iterate over the molecule Chembo ID column. Let's go back here. Let me show you. Molecule. Molecule Chembo ID. Okay. So this data set is comprised of many compounds. And a compound is a drug, a molecule. A molecule is a chemical structure that produces a modulatory activity 
or in other words, it exerts some effect on the target protein. Kind of like when you take medication and the medication exerts some effect on you. Like you might feel drowsy, you might feel thirsty, which are the side effects, but the drug will directly act on the target protein in order to produce the desired biological effect, which ultimately cures your symptoms. And that is why you're taking drugs, right? Or medication, right? And so you see that this is the Chembo molecule ID. So each compound will be described by a molecule Chembo ID. And so each row represents one compound. And there might be a possibility that multiple rows will contain the same molecule Chembo ID. And if that is the case, for simplicity, we're going to keep only one of them, okay? Because we don't want any redundancy in the data set. Right, so for the molecule Chembo ID, let me show you before we iterate. So DF2 dot molecule Chembo ID. So it essentially contains the Chembo ID as I have mentioned. So they are the unique identification number of each molecule. And so we're going to iterate through each of them, right? But first, we're going to create a empty variable called mo CID. And so in each iteration of the for loop here, we're going to append the molecule Chembo ID into this empty variable. So let's run that. And then we're going to see that the mo CID contains the molecule Chembo ID again. Okay, and here we're going to do the same thing. We're going to define an empty variable called canonical smiles. And then we're going to iterate over the canonical smiles. And then we're going to append it to the empty variable here. And then we're going to do the same for the standard value, which is the IC50. But actually, this is only one way of doing things. So this might actually be a complicated way. Actually, another way would be to simply So in df2 dot molecule chembo. Okay, so we just call selection equals to whatever we want. So we want the molecule chembo ID and we want the canonical smiles and we want the standard value and then df2 we have the selection. And then we're going to assign this to DF3. Actually, this might be an easier way. DF3. Right, so we get the data frame here containing the three columns that we needed. And actually, we could do the same here as well. Canonical smiles. Okay, I have to run it first probably have to run this. Okay. And so it gives you the same thing. So I'm not sure. And we also want the bioactivity class as well. Which do we have? Yeah, we have it here, bioactivity class. And so we're gonna just append to it. And so to DF3, we're gonna have PD concat. And then the F3 with the bioactivity class. And then axis equals to one. No. Oh, so there are series and data frame objects. Oh, it's okay. So it's a list. So this needs to be made into a data frame or a series. That would work. All right. So it works. So same thing here. Does it look the same? Yes, it looks the same. Okay, so actually this might be a easier way. So let me copy this. Okay, so I'm offering an alternative method here as well, and I'm going to move it below this. Okay. okay, so select either way. Okay, so now we're going to create a CSV file for the pre-processed bioactivity data. And we're assigning DF3 dot to CSV and then the name of the file and then the index will be false. And that's all. So let's check the file. LS. Okay, so here it is, the pre-processed data. So let's copy that into the Google Drive.
pre-processed data. Let's have a look. All right, so we have both of them here. So let me annotate this a bit. All right, so congratulations. You have successfully downloaded the biological activity data from the Chambo database. And so now we could use this for subsequent machine learning model building. And I'm going to cover that in a future video. And so please stay tuned to that. While in the meantime, you could also use this data set that you have created on a data science project of your own. Or you could also modify the search query at the beginning. So let me show you. Instead of using coronavirus, you could use another keyword. Let's say aromatase. So the aromatase is an enzyme as part of the cytochrome P450, which is responsible for breast cancer. And so the goal of drug discovery effort is to find a compound or a molecule that will be able to inhibit the function of the aromatase enzyme. Okay, and so here is the human aromatase enzyme. So as you can see, try out different keywords and see what protein you have. And then you could use this novel data set in your own data science project. So the possibilities are endless. And so now you have original data that you could play around with that no one else in the world might have because you guys might be using different keywords, right? And so this will be a novelty in itself. And so if this video was helpful to you, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe to the channel for more awesome content on data science. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And so please enjoy the journey. Okay, so today's part two of the bioinformatics project series, where we will show you how to apply data science for drug discovery. And in the previous video, I've covered about how you can collect data directly from the bioactivity database, Chambo. And so in today's video, we're going to take a step further by computing molecular descriptors, and we're going to then perform exploratory data analysis on the computed descriptors. And so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is head over to the GitHub of the data professor, and you want to click on the code repository, and then scroll down and find Python. And so before we proceed with doing part two, exploratory data analysis, we're going to do a recap of part one. And we're not going to do a ordinary recap, but we're going to do a concise version. And so in this concise version, let's have a look. We've trimmed down the code and it will be a bit more lightweight. Okay, so I'll show you that in a moment. And so what you want to do now is you want to scroll down and right click on the raw link and then save link as and then you want to save it into your computer. Okay, and then you can follow along on your local computer using Jupyter Notebook. However, if you want to use Google Colab, we can do that as well. And so let's go to the Colab right now. And so in Colab, you can click on the file, open notebook, and then click on the GitHub tab. And then you want to type in data professor and then go to the code repository. So make sure that it is data professor slash code. And then you want to click on the CDD ML part one bioactivity data concise. Okay, but I'm going to use the one already in my collab. And aside from part one, we're going to also do part two, which is also in the Python repository under code. And then you want to click on the CDD ML part two exploratory data analysis. And then you want to right click on the raw link and save link as and then also save it into your computer. And so we could do the same thing right inside Colab by file open notebook. Okay, and then you want to click on the GitHub and type in data professor slash code. Enter. 
and then you want to find CDD ML part two exploratory data analysis and click on that one. Okay, but since I already have it locally, I'm going to use it. Okay, so let's start with part one. So you want to click on the connect and then give it some time to load up. Okay, so let's go over what I have done in this concise version. So essentially there's two things. So the first thing is that redundant code cells were deleted. And the second part is that code cells for saving files to Google Drive has also been deleted. And so at the end of the notebook, we can simply download it by clicking on the files button on the left hand side of the panel and then we could download a copy of the zip file of the curated data okay so i'm going to show you that in just a moment all right so the notebook is loaded and you want to install the chamber web resource client so go ahead and run the cell all right so it's installed and let's go ahead and import the libraries and let's run the code cell for searching for coronavirus and this is the result and so we're going to select the fifth entry which has the index number of four right here and so let's run that code cell so a detailed explanation of all of this has already been given in the previous video so i'm just going to run the code cell one by one so if you want further information, please check out the previous video of part one. Okay, and so this is the bioactivity class label. Combine the data frames and writing out the output file. Okay, and so let's download the pre-processed file. And there you go. Right. So a recap, in order to download this file, make sure that you hover your mouse over the three dotted line on the far right of the name of the file and then click on it and then choose download. All right. So we're done with the part one. And so now let's continue with part two. And so it should be noted that explanation for all of the code cells in this part one has already been given in the previous video, the part one of the bioinformatics project series. Okay, and so let's proceed to the contents that are intended for this part two of the bioinformatics project series. And so let's close this notebook and now let's go to the part two and make sure to click on the connect. And then you want to run the code cell for installing Conda and RDKit. And so what RDKit essentially will allow you to do is it will allow you to compute the molecular descriptors for the compounds in the data set that we have compiled from part one. Okay, so let me explain again. In part one, we have already downloaded the data set of the biological activity from the Chambo database. And so the data set will comprise of the molecule names and the corresponding smiles notation which is the information about the chemical structure which we will use in this part two in order to compute the molecular descriptors and the data from part one also contains the ic50 which in part one we have already performed the binning into the bioactivity class active inactive and intermediate okay and so in this part two we're going to select only two bioactivity class which are the active and the inactive so that we can easily compare between the active compounds and the inactive compounds okay and so without further ado let's have a look at the code so now conda and rdkit has already been installed and so let's load up the pandas library and make sure to click on the file button here on the left hand panel and then you want to upload and then choose the bioactivity data that we have prepared from the previous part one okay and so it's right here now it has already been uploaded and then we can close the panel here okay and so let's load up the csv file so the following block of codes we're going to compute the lipinski rule of five descriptors or simply lipinski descriptors you might be wondering what is lipinski descriptors well lipinski descriptor originates from 
the fact that Christopher Lipinski, who is a scientist at Pfizer, came up with a set of rules called the Rule of Five, which was used to evaluate the drug likeness of compounds. And so the drug likeness is based on the key pharmacokinetic properties comprising of absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, which has an acronym of ATME. And this is also known as the pharmacokinetic profiles. And so what essentially ATME will tell us is that it will tell us the relative drug likeness of the compound, whether it can be absorbed into the body, distributed to the proper tissue and organs, and become metabolized and eventually become excreted from the body. And so in order to derive the rule of five, Christopher Lipinski collected a set of FDA approved drugs that are normally administered orally. And then based on his analysis, he observed that the four descriptors that was used for his analysis had corresponding values in multiples of five as follows. So the molecular weight should be less than 500 Dalton. The octanal water partition coefficient or log P has to be less than five. Hydrogen bond donors is less than five. Hydrogen bond acceptors is less than 10. And so as you can see, all of the values are multiples of five. Okay, and so let's proceed with computing the descriptors. So let's load up the library and then compute the descriptors. So this is a custom function that was inspired from this link here. And it was modified to include the descriptors for this analysis. All right, and so we have the Lipinski descriptors in this data frame. And in order to get that, we're going to apply the custom function called Lipinski, which was the custom function here, which takes in as input the SMILES notation. So the SMILES notation contains the chemical information. And so what the chemical information tells us is the exact atomic details of the molecule. And so it's going to use that as the input to compute the molecular descriptors. All right, and so let's continue. And so let's run that. And let's have a look at the data frame. All right, so we can see that there are four descriptors that we have previously covered, including molecular weight, log P, which will tell us the size. Log P will tell us the solubility. And so this is the relative number of the hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. And so we can see that there are a total of 133 rows and four columns. And as a recall, the data frame that we have read directly from the curated file from part one is shown in the DF data frame. And so we're going to combine the DF data frame and the Lipinski data frame together because we want to have the standard value and the bioactivity class columns. And so we're going to use the pdconcat function in order to combine the df and df Lipinski data frame. And then we're going to put it into the df combined variable. And then let's have a look at the new data frame. All right. And so you can see that the last four columns are integrated into the df data frame here. All right. And so the dimensions of the data frame is correct. 133 rows. And then the number of columns has been expanded to be eight. Okay, and so now we're going to convert the standard value, which is the IC50, to the PIC50 scale. And so the reason for doing the IC50 to PIC50 transformation, which is essentially the negative logarithmic transformation from the IC50 value, is that the original IC50 value has uneven distribution of the data points. And so in order to make the distribution more even, we will have to apply negative logarithmic transformation. Okay, and so let let me give you a challenge. Let me know how the distribution of the original IC50 looks like versus the PIC50 that you have performed the transformation. So let me know in the comments after you have tried this. And so a hint is that what you can do is perform a simple scatter plot. Okay, and so let me know in the comments if you see any difference in the distribution of IC50 versus the PIC50. Okay, so let's do the actual transformation by running this custom function. Oh, and one point here, which is worthy to note is the IC50 value, which is contained inside the standard value column has large numbers. And the large number here will after performing negative logarithm, it will become a negative value. And in order to prevent that, we're going to need to cap the maximum value 
right here to be here, 100 million. So we need to cap the value to be 100 million so that the resulting PIC50 would not be less than 1.0. Otherwise, it will have negative values and that will make interpretation a bit more difficult. Okay, and so we're gonna cap the values to 100 million by creating a custom function called norm value. And so what essentially the norm value function would do is that it will read through the individual values in the standard value value column and if the value is greater than 100 million it will cap the value to be 100 million so that the value will not exceed 100 million and so therefore after performing negative logarithmic transformation it will not be less than 1.0 okay and so let's perform the norm value here let's describe the value again and notice that the maximum value is 1 times 10 to the 8th power so it is 100 million Whereas previously, the value is rather big, okay? Okay, and so we're going to apply the PIC50 function to the normalized data frame. And then we're going to call the new data frame to be DF final. Okay, and so notice that we have now created a new column called PIC50. And we have already deleted the original IC50 column. Notice that the standard value here column has now been deleted and it is converted to be PIC50, which is the negative logarithmic form of the IC50. And so let's describe the data frame. All right, and so now the maximum value is 7.3 and the minimum value is 1.0. And what we want to do now is to allow simple comparison between the two bioactivity classes. Therefore, we're going to delete the intermediate class and we're going to call the new data frame to be DF2 class. All right, and so we have now 119 rows by eight columns. And so let's perform exploratory data analysis using the Lipinski descriptors. And so in cheminformatics or drug discovery, we're going to call the exploratory data analysis to be chemical space analysis. Because what it essentially does is it allows us to look at the chemical space. And the chemical space is kind of like a chemical universe, right? So as Jose Medina Franco puts it, each chemical compound could be thought of as like stars. Okay, and so the active molecules would be compared to a constellation and it will be referred to as constellation and so he developed a approach which he termed constellation plot whereby you could perform chemical space analysis and create the constellation plot whereby the active molecule would be correspondingly have larger size in comparison with the less active molecule and so we're going to apply a similar concept in our plot here as i will show you in the next few moments here and so what we want to do first is import the library Seaborn and the matplotlib as PLT. And so now we're going to create a simple frequency plot of the two bioactivity classes. So using this block of code, we're going to create a frequency plot comparing the inactive and the active molecules. And in doing so, we're also going to save it as a PDF file, right? And so the X and Y labels are obtained using these two lines of code and the frequency plot is using the count plot function where we use x variable to be bioactivity class right here and so as you can see there is no need to define the y variable because the y variable here is the frequency and so the edge color is black which means that the bar will have a black outline Okay, and so being able to save it as the PDF file will allow you to use the resulting files for your report, for your publication, for your project. And as I have already mentioned in the part one of this bioinformatics project series, these two notebooks are crafted based on actual research protocol that we use in our own research group. Okay, and so let's proceed. All right, so now we're going to make a scatter plot of the molecular weight versus the log P or the solubility of the molecules. And we're first going to start by defining the figure size to be 5.5 by 5.5. And we're going to use the scatter plot function here, whereby the X variable will be MW or molecular weight, and the Y variable will be the log P, and the data will be DF2 class. And the hue here would refer to the color, and so the color will be defined 
defined on the basis of the bioactivity class. And because there are two classes, you will see that the color comprises of blue and orange, whereby blue will refer to the inactive molecule and orange will refer to the active molecule. And the size of the data points here will be according to the PIC50 values. And we define the edge color to be black, which is the edge of the circles. And the alpha transparency is defined to be 0.7. And the X label and Y label are custom here, MW and log P with a font size of 14. And we have the font weight to be bold. And in this line, we're going to define that we want the figure legend to be outside the plot. Otherwise, it will be embedded inside, which will make it very difficult to see. So we opted to have the figure legend outside. And then finally, we're going to save it into the PDF file. Okay, so let's run this block of code here. All right, so it's finished. And so let's do the same thing for the PSC50 value. So the same concept applies, just changing the name of the variables. And so here we see the distribution of the inactive class and the active class. And so this is to be expected because we use the threshold to define active and inactive. And so the threshold that we used was five and six, right? So if the PIC50 value is greater than six, it will be active. And if the PIC50 value is less than five, it will be inactive. And so you can see that the distribution of the inactive is rather vast in comparison to the distribution of the active molecules, which is between six and seven, whereas the inactive is between one and five. Okay, and so we're going to perform Man Whitney U test in order to look at the difference between the two bioactivity class, active and inactive. And so we're going to apply this Man Whitney U test to test the statistical significance of the difference, whether they are different or not different. And so the code for performing the Man Whitney U test was modified from machinelearningmastery.com and we made it into a function. All right, and so let's run it. And let's apply the Man Whitney function to the PIC50. And what it will do is it's going to compare the active class and the inactive class to see whether there is a statistical significance for the PIC50 variable. And so based on this analysis, the p value is rather low. And therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. And therefore, we can say that it is having different distribution, meaning that active and inactive Okay, and so we're going to apply the same plots and statistical analysis for the other four Lipinski descriptors as well. And so let's breeze through this. Box plot, Man Whitney. Box plot, Man Whitney. Box plot, Man Whitney. Oh, again, okay. Man Whitney. Box plot, Man Whitney. And so make a note that all of the files from the Man Whitney and the box plot are saved as files. And so the Man Whitney has its own CSV file and the box plot has its own PDF file. And so we can download all of this at the end in order to use it for your own project and research. And so let's have a look. But before we do that, let's do some interpretation of the results. Okay, so let's make sense of the results here. So let's start with the PIC50 values. So taking a look at the PIC50 values, the actives and inactive displayed statistically significant difference, which is to be expected because the threshold value was already defined at six and five, okay, as I have already explained. Of the four Lipinski descriptors, only log P exhibited no difference between the active and the inactive, while the other three descriptors comprising of MW, number of hydrogen bond donor, and acceptor shows statistically significant difference between the active and inactive. Okay, and so, okay, so let's continue. All right, and so finally, we're going to zip up all of the files comprising of the CSV files and PDF files, which was generated in this notebook. And so all of the Man Whitney U test and the box plot will now be zipped up and we can conveniently download it into our computer. So let's zip up the file and click on the file button on the left panel and then hover your mouse on the three dotted lines, click on it and click on download. All right, and so it will download into your computer. And so you will see the plots that we have generated in the notebook and the resulting 
man whitney u test okay all of them are downloaded as csv file all right so if you find value in this video please give it a thumbs up and if you haven't yet subscribed please subscribe to the channel and as always the best way to learn data science is to do data science and please enjoy the journey Welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Tenen Nanta Senamad, and I'm an associate professor of bioinformatics. And this is the Data Professor YouTube channel. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to continue with the part three of the bioinformatics project series, where I go through how you can implement a bioinformatics project from scratch. So a short recap, in part one, I showed you how you can retrieve the bioactivity data directly from the Chambo database, followed by a quick data preprocessing. In part two, I've shown you how you can calculate the Lipinski descriptor and perform exploratory data analysis. And this video is part three where I'm going to show you how you can calculate molecular descriptors followed by preparing the data set that we will be using for the next part, which is part 4. And in part 4, we're going to do some model building. And so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is head over to the GitHub of the Data Professor and click on the Code Repository. Scroll down and click on Python. Scroll down and notice that I've created three additional files which has the prefix of acetylcholine esterase which is the name of the target protein that our research group have previously published. And the great thing about this target protein is that there are an abundance of bioactivity data and therefore it will be a great starting point for model building. So essentially what I have done is change the name of the target protein in part one and then perform all of the code cells and did the same thing with part two by taking in the output from part one and then I finally exported the files from part two and then use it for part three which is today. And so the export of data from part one and part two will be provided on the GitHub of the data professor. So it will be provided here in the data directory. So you'll be noticing that there are six additional files containing the name acetylcholine esterase 01 until 06. Okay, so let's download the part three acetylcholine esterase. So you could click on it and then you could right click on the raw link and then save it into your computer because I already have it in my Google Colab, so I'm going to use this one. Okay, so let's begin. So you're going to see here that in this part three, we will be calculating molecular descriptors, and then we're going to prepare the data set, which will be used for the next part, part four. And in part four, we're going to perform some model building. So we are going to need to download the Paddle Descriptor software, which is provided on the GitHub of Data Professor. And I'm going to provide the link to the original website of the developers of the Paddle Descriptors, along with the link to the original research paper. Okay, so the paddle.zip file has been downloaded, along with the paddle.sh file, which is the shell script file, containing instructions on how to run the Paddle calculation. Because here, we're going to use Paddle to calculate the molecular descriptors. Okay, so we're going to unzip the folder. Okay, and so we're going to download the acetylcholine esterase 04 file, which is containing the PIC50 along with the three bioactivity class. All right, and so we're going to import pandas as PD, and we're going to import the CSV file and assign it the DF3 variable name. So let's have a look at this data frame. Okay, so we're going to select only the canonical smiles column along with the molecule chamber ID column and we're going to put it in the selection variable and then we're going to subset the data by using DF3 bracket selection which contains the name of the precise columns that we wanted and then we're going to assign the name of DF3 underscore selection and then we're going to save it as molecule.smi. Let's run it. Let's have a look at the file using the bash. Okay, so it contains the SMILES notation here and the name of the molecule. So a quick recap, these SMILES notation 
represents the chemical information that pertain to the chemical structure. So the C here represents the carbon atom, the O represents the oxygen, the N represents nitrogen, okay? And so let's continue. And so in this line, we're going to see how many lines of molecules do we have. And we have 4,695, which matches this number here, 4695. So we wanted to check that all of the rows are coming in the molecule.smi file. Okay, and so we're going to perform the descriptor calculation by running bash paddle.sh. Okay, so maybe you're wondering what is inside the paddle file. Let's have a look. Paddle.sh. So it contains the instruction. So we're going to use Java and then we're going to use one gigabyte of memory. And we're going to use this option because we don't have a display on the Google Colab. So we're going to use the Java AWT headless equal to true. And then we're going to specify the dash jar function because we're going to use the paddle descriptor dot jar file. And then here we're going to remove the salt and the salt are the sodium and the chloride, which are in the chemical structure. And so this program will automatically remove all salts and also small organic acid from the chemical structure. So if that sounded gibberish, then so it essentially means that we are cleaning the chemical structure so that there are no impurity. OK, and here are the other options pertaining to how we also clean the chemical structure. And then this option tells the program that we're going to compute the molecular fingerprint and the fingerprint type will be pop chem fingerprint. Okay. And so finally it will output the descriptors into the file called descriptors output.csv and let's run it. Some molecules are taking five seconds. Some are 0 0.6. Okay. Some are fairly quick 0 0.3 okay. because we have 4,695. It's going to take you about 18 to 19 minutes to complete. So why don't we just stop this and then we can download directly the computed file, which is here, descriptors output.csv. So why don't you head over to the data professor GitHub, click on the data repository, and then you will see this page and then scroll down and find descriptors output.csv. Click on it. And then right click on the download button and save link as and then download it into your computer. So we're going to save it into the desktop and I'm going to change the save as type to be all files and I'm going to change .txt to be csv. Okay, so it's automatically opening it for me. Okay, so we're going to go back to this notebook and then as you see, it's barely up to about 200. So I'm going to stop this if it allows me to. All right, so it stopped. So let's see if there's any generated file. So it has generated some output. And so I'm going to delete this because I'm going to upload the completed version. So here I'm going to click on the upload and then this is the desktop and I'm going to click on the descriptors output.csv. Okay, and it's currently uploading. Wait one moment. So let's list the files. So, okay, so it's uploading. So notice the file size. Okay, so it's increasing. That's a good sign. Wait one moment. It's fairly big file. Almost. Hang in there. All right, so it's finished. So let's have a look again. So it's about 8.3 megabytes. And so we're going to read the descriptors output into df3 underscore x. And so here we're going to prepare the x and y data matrices. And the x data matrix will comprise of the molecular descriptors, which are the PubChem fingerprints. So let's have a look. And so we're going to delete the first column here, the name, because we want only the molecular features. So let's drop it using the dot drop function and the name of the column that we want it to be dropped. And then we see that the name column has been dropped and then we reassign it back to df3 underscore x. All right, so now let's create the y data matrix. 
And here we're going to take the PIC50 column directly from DF3 data frame, which is the initially loaded data frame. And then we're going to assign it to the DF3 underscore Y. And then here we're going to combine X and Y together. So this really depends, but for portability, we're going to combine it and then we're going to output it into a CSV file, which we will be uploading to the GitHub. And then we're going to use that for part four. Okay, and so here we're going to output this data set 3 data frame into a CSV file. And notice that the name here is fairly long. And the purpose for having such a long name is to allow less confusion and to allow us to easily see what is the purpose of this file. And so the first segment of this name is the name of the target protein, which is the acetylcholine esterase. 06 is just the sequential order number. And so bioactivity data 3 class PIC50 essentially tell us that it contains the bioactivity data information along with three categorical class comprising of active, inactive, and intermediate. And it also contains the PSC50 values. And then the last segment here is PopCam FP, signifying that it contains the PopCam fingerprint. So this will become handy when we have more than one fingerprint type. And so Paddle allows you to compute more than 10 different fingerprint types. And so let's make it your homework to try to compute other different fingerprint types. So you want to play around with the options and see what other molecular fingerprints are available. And then you could rename the file accordingly. All right. So let's see if we have already written out the file and it's right here. Okay. And then we're going to write out the file. So let's run the code cell here and let's save it into our computer. All right. So it's finished and it's going to open up for us to see. All right, let's see. So these are the fingerprints of PubChem and the last column is the PIC50. So we're going to use this file to perform model building in the next episode. So please stay tuned to that. So support this channel by smashing the like button, subscribe if you haven't yet done so, and click on the notification bell in order to be notified of the next video. And if you have come this far in the video, please give yourself a big clap and comment down below that you have watched until the end. And big kudos to you guys. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey. Okay, so welcome back to this part four of the bioinformatics from scratch series, where I show you how to do a bioinformatics project using machine learning in a step-by-step -step manner. So in this video, we're going to build a simple regression model based on the random forest algorithm. And the data set that we're using is based on the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, which is derived from the previous tutorial videos. And so without further ado, let's get started. So the first thing that you want to do is head over to the GitHub of the data professor, and then you want to click on the code link and then click on Python. And then you want to find CDDML part four. And so if you haven't yet gone through the previous three episodes here, please make sure to go through that in the provided playlist up and below. And so you want to click on the part four and then right click on the raw link and then save link as and then save it into your computer. All right, so let's get started. So let's connect to the Google Colab. All right, so for those of you new here, you could open the notebook directly by clicking on the open notebook, click on GitHub, and then you type in data professor, and then find CDD ML part four right here, and then you click on that one. Okay, so I'm gonna use the one provided here. So let's begin. So the first block of code here is to import the necessary libraries. So we're going to simply run that. And then we're going to load in the data set that we have prepared from the prior videos. So we're going to load it in. And so the data set here is based on the PopChem fingerprint. 
and it's going to contain the bioactivity data for the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. So one of you asked a very great question. In the prior video, in part three, we have prepared a PopCam fingerprint. And in part two, we have prepared Lipinski descriptors. And then the question was, what's the difference between these two? So that's a very great question. So firstly, the Lipinski descriptor will provide us with a set of simple molecular descriptors that essentially will be giving us a quick overview of the drug-like properties of the molecule. And so historically, Christopher Lipinski created a set of four descriptors that he had investigated in his research that are responsible for drug-like properties, whereby he analyzed a set of orally active drugs. And then he came up with this rule of five, whereby compounds that are passing the rule of five will make good oral drugs. And so for the PopChem fingerprint, which we will be using today as well for the model building, it is describing the local features of the molecules. So the Lipinski descriptor will be describing the global features of the molecule, particularly the molecular size of the molecule, the solubility of the molecule, and also the number of hydrogen bond donor and acceptor, which is the propensity to accept and donate hydrogen bonds. And by local features for the PopChem, I mean that each molecule will be described by the unique building blocks of the molecule. So if we think of molecules as kind of like a Lego building blocks, so each molecule will be comprised of several Lego building blocks. And the way at which the Lego building blocks are connected, it will create a unique properties for the drug. And that is the essence of drug discovery and also the essence of drug design. So essentially, the connectivity of the Lego blocks are giving rise to the unique structure of the molecule and also the unique molecular properties. And so therefore, we have to find a way to rearrange the Lego building block in such a way that the molecule provides the most potency toward the target protein that it wants to interact while also being safe and not so toxic. All right, because if the molecule is toxic, then you have side effects happening. All right, so we have already downloaded the data set now. And so let's have a look at the input features. So the PopCam fingerprint has 881 input features. So let's think of the input features for the PopCam fingerprint as kind of like a unique, as the name implies, fingerprint. So each molecule will be given a unique fingerprint, kind of like each of us humans have a unique fingerprint, right? And so the unique fingerprint of each molecule will allow the machine learning algorithm to learn from the unique properties in terms of the molecular properties of the compound and then create a model that will be able to distinguish between compounds that are active, compounds that are inactive, right? Because this is the goal of our model building. We want to see which functional group or fingerprint are essential for designing a good drug or a potent drug. And so the target variable that we are using for our prediction is called PIC50, which is the minus negative logarithm of the IC50 value. IC50 is the inhibition concentration at 50%. Okay, so let's have a look further in 3.1, the input features. So notice that, okay, let me increase the font size. It might be a bit too small here. Okay, there you go. So for those of you who are using mobile phones to look at this video, so I'm gonna increase the font size. So let's continue. So the input feature here, x equals to df dot drop. So we're gonna drop the PIC50 in order to create the x variable matrix. Okay, let's see. So the df here is reading in the downloaded data set file, which is comprised of the fingerprint and the PIC50 value. Okay, so it's in a DF data frame. Okay, so in order to create the input features, we're going to drop the PIC50 column because the PIC50 column will be used as the Y variable. So upon dropping the PIC50, we will have only the PopCam fingerprint. And so we will call this X. And then for Y, we're going to use DF.PIC50. Okay, so let's run the blocks of code here. Oh, okay, I have to run the top one here first. All right, and then run the X. All right, run the Y. All right, so X and Y are loaded in, and then we're gonna have a look at the shape of the data. So we have 4,695 rows or compounds, and we have 888, and then we have 881 PopCam fingerprints. So here we're gonna remove the low variance features. 
and then we're gonna have a look. So we have 137 fingerprints left, which is from the 881. So variables having low variance will be removed. And then we're gonna split the data in a 80-20 fashion. And then we're gonna look at the data dimension again. All right, so let's build a simple regression model using random forest. And so we're gonna use n estimator to be 100. And then upon building the model, we get about 0 0.50. All right, so we did not set the seed number, so it is varying over time because of the random features that it is taking to build the model. All right, so why don't we set seed here? Okay, so let's set the seed number import numpy as np and then let's build the model 512 let's run it again 512 try again all right so you see that if we don't set the seed number the seed number will be randomized and then we get different results so here we're setting the seed to 100 and we're getting the same results so let's make the prediction and now here in this block of code, we're going to make a scatter plot of the experimental versus the predicted PIC50 values. And then here you go. We have a scatter plot of experimental and predicted. All right. So if you're finding value in this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't yet done so. Hit on the notification bell in order to be notified of the next video. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey. Welcome back to part five of the bioinformatics project from scratch series, where I show you how you could build your own computational drug discovery model using the machine learning algorithm. In today's episode, I will be showing you how you could compare several machine learning algorithms for building regression models of the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. And today, we're going to be using a lazy and efficient way of building several machine learning algorithms. And this was shown in a recent video using the Lazy Predict Python library. And so we're going to be using that for today's tutorial. And before proceeding further, let's do a quick recap. So in part one, I have shown you how you could collect original data set in biology that you could use in your own data science project. Particularly, I have demonstrated to you how you could download and pre-process the biological activity data from the Chambo database. And the data set is comprised of compounds and molecules that have been biologically tested for their activity toward the target organism or protein of interest. Then, in part two, I have shown to you how you could calculate the Lipinski descriptors, which are descriptors used for evaluating the likelihood of being a drug-like molecule. And then I've shown to you how you could perform some basic exploratory data analysis on these Lipinski descriptors. Particularly, the EDA are based on making simple box plot and scatter plot in order to visualize the differences of the active and inactive subset of the compound. In part three, I have made some changes to the target protein, and then we're using the acetylcholine esterase as it provides a larger data set to work with. And so in this part, we have already computed the molecular descriptors using the paddle descriptor software, and then we prepared the data set comprising of the X and Y data frames, and then we use that to build a prediction model in the subsequent part, which is part four where we use the descriptors generated from part three in order to build a regression model using the random forest algorithm. And now to today's episode, let's get started. So here we're going to be comparing several machine learning algorithms using the lazy predict library and so the first thing that you need to do is install the lazy predict. And so in a prior video, I've shown you how you could use the lazy predict to do a quick and rapid model building of classification and also regression models in just a few lines of code. And so let's start by installing the library. 
Okay, and so we have already installed it. And then we're going to be importing the necessary libraries. And so here we're using the pandas, Seaborn, and also the scikit-learn library. Specifically, we're importing the train test split function. And then we're going to be importing the lazy predict and also the lazy regressor function. And so now we're going to be loading up the data set and we're going to be directly downloading it from the GitHub of Data Professor. And so the links is here, wget to download it. And now we're going to be reading in the file and then we're going to be assigning it to the DF data frame. Then we're going to be splitting it up into the X and Y variables. And let's take a look at the dimension of the X variable. And so here we see that it has a total of 4,695 rows or the number of compounds in the data set. And it has a total of 881 descriptors or the features or the number of columns. And so the first thing that we need to do is we're going to be removing the low variance features. So those that have low variance, and let's take a look at the dimension of the data set again. And so we have a reduced subset from 881 to be 137 variables. Now we're going to be performing a data split using the 80-20 ratio. All right, now comes the fun part. So as you can see here, we're going to be building more than 20 machine learning models. And so we're using only two lines of code here. So the first one is like any other scikit-learn functions for building the model is to assign the machine learning algorithm into a classifier variable. And then we're going to be assigning the results from the prediction after we built the model. And then we're assigning it to the train and test variables. So the train and test variables here will be containing the performance of the model's prediction. And so let's build the model. So here it has 39 models, 39 machine learning algorithms. So this might take some time because the data is relatively big at almost 5,000 rows. And so it should be noted here that model building is using default parameters for all of the 39 algorithms used. And so if you want to perform hyperparameter optimization, that will be a topic for another video, right? And so models have been built and let's have a look at the train. Okay, so LGBM is the best model here. So from our prior tutorials, random forest was used for the model building. And so here it had slightly better performance. Let's have a look at the test set. LGBM regressor. Random forest also at third place here. But the thing is, they're roughly the same. Okay, 0 0.57 and 0 0.56. Let's have a look at the data visualization of the model performance. And so the bar plot of the R squared values is provided here. And we're going to have a look at the RMSE values here. And then we're also going to have a look at the calculation time. Provide it here. So the longer the bars become, the longer it takes to build the model. All right, and so congratulations, we have already built several machine learning models for comparison. In prior videos of the Bioinformatics from Scratch series, you have learned how to compile your very own bioactivity data set directly from the Chambo database, how to perform 
exploratory data analysis on the computed Lipinski descriptors. You have also learned how to build random forest model as well as building several machine learning models for comparing the model performance using the lazy predict library. And so in this video, we will be taking a look at how we can take that machine learning model of the bioactivity data set and convert it into a web application that you could deploy on the cloud that will allow users to be able to make predictions on your machine learning model for the target protein of your interest. And so without further ado, we're starting right now. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is go to the bioactivity prediction app folder. And so this folder will be provided in the GitHub link in the video description. And so before we start, let me show you how the app looks like. So I'm going to activate my Conda environment. And for you, please make sure to activate your own Conda environment as well. So on my computer, I'm using the data professor environment. So I'm going to activate it by typing in conda activate data professor. And I'm going to go to the desktop because that is where the streamlit folder resides. And then we're going to go to the bioactivity folder. Let's have a look at the contents. So the app.py will be the application. And so we're going to type in streamlit run app.py in order to launch this bioactivity prediction app. Okay, and so this is the bioactivity prediction app that I'm going to be showing you today, how you could build one. And so let's have a look at the example input file. So this is the example input file. So in order to proceed with using this app, we're going to have to upload the file, drag and drop right here, or browse files and select the input file. And so while waiting for a input file to be uploaded, you can see here that the blue box will be giving us a waiting message. So it's saying upload input data in the sidebar to start. So essentially, the input file contains the smiles notation and the Chembo ID. And so the Chembo ID, you could think of it as kind of like the name of the molecule here. And particularly, the Chembo ID is a unique identification number of this particular molecule that Chembo database has assigned to it. And the smiles notation here is a one-dimensional representation of this particular chemical structure. And so this smiles notation will be used by the paddle descriptor software that we're going to be using here today in the app in order to generate molecular fingerprint, which describe the unique chemical features of the molecule. And then such molecular fingerprints will then be used by the machine learning model to make a prediction. Okay, and so the prediction will be the PIC50 values that you see here. And the PIC50 value is the bioactivity against the target protein of interest. And so in this application, the target protein is acetylcholinesterase. And this target protein is a target for the Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and so this app is built in Python using the Streamlit library and the molecular fingerprints are calculated using the paddle descriptor. And so back in 2016, we have published a paper describing the development of a QSAR model for predicting the bioactivity of the acetylcholinesterase. And so if you're interested in this article, please feel free to read it. And so I'm going to provide you the link in the video description as well. Okay, so let's drag and drop the input file. So Example acetylcholinesterase, I'm going to drag and drop here. And then in order to initiate the prediction, I'm going to press on the predict button. And as you see here, the input file is giving you this data frame. 
and then it's calculating the descriptor and the calculated descriptor is provided here in this particular data frame. So you're going to see here that there are a total of five input molecules and there are 882 columns. And you're going to see here that the first column is the Chembo ID. So in reality, you're going to have a total of 881 molecular fingerprints. And the molecular fingerprints that we're using today is the PubChem fingerprint. And because we have previously built a machine learning model, which I will be showing you using this file, the Jupyter Notebook file, we had reduced the number of descriptors from 881 to 217. No, actually 218 because we have already deleted the first column, the name of the, the Chembo ID column. And so we have reduced from 881 columns to 218 columns. Okay, and so in the code, we're going to be selecting the same 218 columns that you see here, which corresponds to the descriptor subset from the initially full set of 881. Okay, so we're going to use the 218 as the X variables in order to predict the PIC50. And finally, we have the prediction output in the last data frame here. And we have the corresponding Chembo ID. And then we could also download the prediction by pressing on this link. And in the prediction is provided here in the CSV file. Okay. So the data is provided here. All right. And so let's get started, shall we? Okay, so we have to first build our prediction model using the Jupyter Notebook. And then we're going to save the model as a PICO file right here. Okay, so let me show you in which will take just a moment. So let me open up a new terminal. And then I'm going to activate Jupyter, typing in Jupyter Notebook. Okay, so I have to first activate Conda environment. Kind of activate data professor so it's the same environment and then jupyter notebook all right there you go and then i'm going to open up the jupyter notebook all right and here we go so actually this was adapted from one of the prior tutorials in this bioinformatics from scratch series and essentially we're going to just download the calculated fingerprints from the GitHub of Data Professor using this URL link. And so we're importing pandas as PD, and then we're downloading and reading it in using pandas. And the resulting data frame looks like this. And so you're gonna see here that we have all of this. So one column, the last column is PIC50, and then we have 881 columns for the PubChem fingerprint. And then the next cell here is we're going to be dropping the last column or the PIC50 column in order to assign it to the X variable. And then we're going to just select the last column denoted here by minus one and assigning it to the Y variable. And so now that we have the X and Y separated, we're going to next remove the low variance feature from the X variable. So initially we have 881. And so applying a threshold of 0 0.1, this resulted in 218 columns. And then we're going to be saving it into a descriptor list.csv file. So let me show you that. Descriptor list.csv file. Okay, and then you're gonna see here that the first row will contain the names of the fingerprints that are retained. In other words, the name of the descriptors of the 218 columns here. We here can see that PubChem fingerprint 0, 1, 2 has been removed and we have fingerprint 3 and fingerprints 4 until 11 has been removed. Fingerprint 14 has been removed. Fingerprint 17 has also been removed. So more than 600 fingerprints have been deleted from the X variable. And so the removal of excessive redundant features will allow us to build the model much quicker. 
Okay, and so in just a few moments, I will be telling you how we're going to be making use of this descriptor list in order to select the subset from the computed descriptors that we obtain from the input query right here. Let me show you that we get from the input query right here. So out of this small notation, we generated 881 columns and then we're going to be selecting a subset of 218 from the initially 881 by using this particular list of descriptors. Okay. And let's go back to the Jupyter Notebook. All right. Okay, let's save it. And then we're going to be building the model random forest model. We're setting here the random state to be 42, the number of estimators to be 500, and we're using the random forest regressor and we fit the model here in order to train it. And then we're going to be calculating the score, which is the R2 score. And then we're assigning it to the R2 variable. And then finally, we're going to be applying the trained model to make a prediction on the X variable which is the training sets also. And then we're assigning it to the Y pred variable. Okay, so here we see that the R squared value is 0 0.86. And then let's print out the performance. Mean squared error of 0 0.34. And let's make the scatter plot of the actual and predicted values. Okay, so we get this plot here. And then finally, we're going to be saving the model by dumping it using the pickle function, pickle.dump. And then as input argument, we're going to have model. And then we're going to save it as acetylcholine esterase model.pkl. And there you go. We have already saved the model. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close this Jupyter Notebook. Let's head over back and let's take a look at the app.py file. Okay, so let's have a brief look. You're going to see here that the app.py is less than 90 lines of code and about 87 to be exact. And you're going to see that there are some white spaces. So even if we delete all of the white space, it might be even less, maybe 80 lines of code. Okay, and so the first seven lines of code will be importing the necessary libraries. And so we're making use of Streamlit as the web framework. And we're using pandas in order to display the data frame. And the image function from the PIL library is used to display this illustration. And the descriptor calculation will be made possible by using the subprocess library. So that will allow us to compute the paddle descriptor via the use of Java. And we're using the OS library in order to perform file handling. And so here you're going to see that we're using the os.remove in order to remove the molecule.smi file. So I'm going to explain to you that in just a moment. Base64 will be used for encoding, decoding of the file when we will make the file available for download, the prediction results. And the pickle library will be used for loading up the pickled file of the model. Okay, and so you're going to be seeing here that we're making three custom functions. So lines 10 through 15, the first custom function will be our molecular descriptor calculator. So we're defining a function called desk calc and then the statement underneath it will be the bash command and so this bash command is what we're normally using when we type into the command line okay and so this option here will allow us to run the code in the command line without launching a GUI version of paddle descriptor and so without this option here it will launch a GUI version but since we don't want that to happen, we're going to use this option. Okay, and so we're using the jar file to make the calculation of the fingerprint. And then you're going to see here that we have additional options such as removing salt, standardizing the nitro group of the molecule. And then we're using the fingerprint to be the PopChem fingerprint, 
using the XML file here. And then finally, we're generating the molecular descriptor file by saving it to the descriptors underscore output dot CSV file. And so this batch command will be serving as input right here in the subprocess.popen function. Okay. And then finally, after the descriptor has been calculated, we're removing the molecule.smi file. And so the molecule.smi file will be generated in another function. So I will be discussing that in just a moment. And the second custom function that we're generating here is file download. So after making the prediction, we're going to be encoding, decoding the results, and then the output will be available as a file for downloading using this link. And the third function that we're creating is called build model. So it will be accepting the input argument, which is the input data. And then it will be loading up the pickle file, which is the built model into a load model variable. And then the model which we have loaded will be used for making a prediction on the input data, which is specified here. And after a prediction has been made, we're going to be assigning it to the prediction variable. Then we're going to be printing out the header called prediction outputs, which is right here. And underneath it, we're going to create a variable called prediction outputs. And we're going to be creating a pd.series. So essentially, it is a column using pandas. And so the first column is prediction. And then we're naming it PIC50, which is here. And then we're going to create another variable called molecule name. And the column that we're creating is the Chembo ID or the molecule name, which is right here, the first column. And then we're going to be combining these two columns given by the individual variables called prediction outputs and molecule name. So we're using the pd.concat function and then in bracket, we're using molecule name, which is the first column, prediction output, which is the second column. And then we're using an axis equals to one in order to tell it to combine the two variables or the two columns in a side by side manner. Okay, so axis one will allow us to have the two columns side by side. Otherwise, it will be stacked underneath it. So PSC50 column will be stacked underneath the molecule name if the axis was to be zero. Okay, and finally, we're writing out the data frame, which is here, and then we're allowing it to generate the download link, which is right here. And we're making use of the file download function described earlier on here. Okay, and then on lines number 38, we're generating this or displaying this image of the web app. Okay, and lines number 43 until 51 or 52, is the header here the bioactivity prediction app title and then the description of the app and then the credits of the app and this is written in markdown language all right and so let's have a look further lines 55 until 59 will be displaying the sidebar right here so 55 will be displaying the header number one, upload your CSV data. And then we're creating a variable called uploaded file. And here we're using the st.sidebar.file loader, file uploader. And then as input argument, we're displaying the text, upload your input file, which is also right here. And then the type of the file will be the txt file. So right here. And then we're creating a link using Markdown language to the example file provided here to the example acetylcholine esterase. So it's going to be the exact same file that we have selected as input. Okay, so that's the sidebar function that you see here. All right, and so let's have a look further. So here you can see that from line 61 until 87, we have the if and else condition. So if we click on the predict button, which is right here, using the st.sidebar.button function with input argument of predict. So if we click on it, it will make the descriptor calculation and apply the machine learning model to make a prediction. And finally, displaying the results of the prediction right here and allow the user to download the predictions. 
However, if we didn't click anything whereby we loaded up the web page from the beginning, as I will show you right now, you will see a blue box displaying the message of upload input data in the sidebar to start. Okay, so two conditions. If the predict button is clicked, it will make a prediction. Otherwise, it will just display the text here that it is waiting for you to upload the input data. Okay, so let's have a look under the if condition. So upon clicking on the predict button, as you have guessed, it will load the data that you had just drag and dropped, and then it will be saving it as a molecule.smi file. And this very same file here, molecule.smi, will be used by the desk calculation function that we have discussed earlier on. Particularly, the molecule.smi file will be used by the paddle descriptor software for the molecular descriptor calculation. And after the descriptors have been calculated, we will assign it as the x variable. It's right here. Okay, so I'm going to tell you in just a moment. Lines number 65 will be printing out the header right here. So let me make a prediction first so that we can see. Let's drag and drop the input file. Press on the predict button. It's right here. Original input data. Line number 65. Line number 66 will be printing out the data frame of the input file. So you're going to see here two columns. The smile notation, which represent the chemical structure information, and the Chembo ID column. Lines number 68 will be displaying a spinner. So upon loading up this results here by pressing on the predict button. You saw earlier on that they had a yellow message box saying calculating descriptor. And so underneath, we have the desk calculation function. Okay, and after it is calculated, it will be displaying the following content, the calculated molecular descriptor, which follows here. On lines number 72, right here, calculated molecular descriptor, and then it will be reading in the calculated descriptor from the descriptor output.csv file. It will be assigning it to the desk variable. Then we're going to be writing out right here and showing the data frame of the descriptors that have been calculated. And then we're going to be printing out the shape of the descriptor. And so we see here that it has five rows or five molecules, 881 molecular fingerprints, and then in lines number 78 until 82, it's going to be the subset of descriptor that is read from the previously built model from the file descriptorList.csv. And so you can see here that we're going to create a variable called xList, and then we're reading in the columns, okay? And then we're going to be from the initial descriptor of 881, we're going to be selecting a subset provided in the X list, and then we assign the subset of descriptor, which is 218 descriptors selected from the initially set of 881, and then we assign that to the desk subset variable. And then finally, we print it out as a data frame, and then we also print out the dimension as well. So we see here that there are five molecules and 218 columns or 218 fingerprints. And finally, we make use of this calculated molecular descriptor subset and use it as an input argument to the build model function. And then as I have mentioned earlier on, it will be building the model. And then finally, it will be displaying the model prediction result right here. And so users can download it into their own computer. Thank you for watching until the end of this video. And if you enjoy bioinformatics tutorial, then you might want to also check out my YouTube channel where I have several other bioinformatics tutorial and content where I show you how you could use Python or R to make sense of biological data sets. And I like to end my videos by saying the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey.